Hey everyone, Andre here along with Tom and a very special guest today being Michael Englehart from previously Next Level Games, who is a director on Mario Strikers, Mario Strikers Charged, and Punch Out Wii. Uh, they're currently over at EA, but we're very curious to talk with them about uh, their past working on specifically Mario Strikers and a few other things, given the recent announcement of Mario Strikers Battle League. Mike, how are you doing today? Good, good, good. Very happy to be here with you guys. Well, thanks for being on with us. Like, I was looking through the uh, credits, as I was telling you beforehand, of, of Mario Strikers, and I'm like, this Mike guy's been across the entire series. Like, I have to talk to him about, you know, what it was like to work on the games and what it's like to see a new game now uh, that you're not involved with in the series since you left Next Level Games back in, what was it, 2008 or so? 2000, 2010 is when I, when okay. I left there. Got it. And uh, have you been at EA ever since, or was there a few stop gaps between then? No, so I've been doing yeah, I've been doing games for 22 years now, and spent the first half of my career in console, and then popped over and worked in mobile for the past uh, almost 11 years, and then now have returned back to console. So I've got a chance to kind of go full circle here, I guess you can say, and and. Uh, uh, see games on all different platforms, but uh, I'm definitely excited to see what's coming of the, I guess, the threequel in the Strikers series and uh, being on the other side of the fence for the first time as a gamer getting ready to enjoy a uh, series I was a part of bringing to life. Yeah, so I have a lot of questions about Mario Strikers history, but before we get to those, what is it like to see a game that you helped bring to life uh, now being handled by, you know, now being handled by a team, you know, it's someone other than yourself even? Um, is that weird to see, and uh, is it surprising? Are you excited? Like, what kind of emotions do you experience watching that trailer for the first time? Well, I mean, there, you know, there's in the industry you create a lot of great relationships. So I'd say, you know, initially I'm I was uh, excited for um, uh, the team that's over there. I still know some people, um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's strange. You you never know kind of where the gaming industry is going to go, and I never. Um, envisioned coming to the industry and being on the other side of the fence as a gamer getting ready to consume a series that I had a hand in making. It's definitely a game that a lot of people were thirsting for. I think the big thing yeah. we were really surprised with in the creation of the series was just how well it was received. We knew the first one did well on GameCube and then the sequel, you know, the sequel went kind of crazy and people as the years went by, you just see so many people on social media saying, when is the next Strikers coming out? When is the next Strikers coming out? It's been a long wait, but based on what I've seen so far, I think they've waited for the right time. And, and it's exciting they have a captive audience. And yeah, I have to admit, it's a little, it, it is a little bit weird because you <laughs> part of you feels connected to it right. and you're not part of it, but you'll, you'll always be a part of it because you were there from, from the very beginning. Yeah, so are you are you excited to uh, to play it for yourself or do you think or is that experience going to be a little odd, you think, just because, again, it's a series you've been so close to, uh, and, you know, it, it just, I, I mean, I don't know, as a creator, is that would that feel different for you, you think, when you actually go to play it for yourself? Yeah, I mean, to be honest, I don't even know what it's going to feel like, um, <laughs> because I, I've never been in the situation before. Right. I, you know, I've played games since I was four years old, so there's, there's definitely excitement just in trying something new. And, um, you know, I, I appreciate the fact that they're bringing it back. And you want to see kind of where the series has gone. And I have thought for years, you know, I, I felt Nintendo was going to do a third version of the game. And you think about, well, what would they do? What would you do if you were still in those shoes? And a lot of what I've seen so far matches some of my initial thoughts of where I would take it. Because um, people have asked me if there was another one, what, what would you have done? Right. But as well, you don't see everything in initial trailers. So I'm also very interested to see you know, how the series will evolve, what's new. We've got some glimpses into some of that. And, you know, you have to put your developer uh, background aside and also just get a chance to enjoy what I'm sure will be a quality product from Nintendo. Yeah, it is. Um, it, Nintendo has a tendency to, with the first trailer, they just show you the premise of the game. Then the second trailer is where they tend to really blow it out and really show you why you should be excited for a game or even more so excited. So it's possible that they're even holding back some stuff that we haven't even seen yet. Uh, but is there anything we've seen so far that kind of surprised you or uh, caught you off guard? Maybe any ideas that had been abandoned before they saw return or just anything in general that you're like, oh, that's uh, kind of neat. <laughs> well, in, in Strikers Charge, we did have a, um, what was a crowd riot back then. I guess Luigi's Hyper Strike is coming out as a tornado. But I, I wonder if that, you know, because we did some work on that tech and it just never, we never found a way to get it worked into the mm -hmm. game in a proper way. So that was something that was interesting, made me think, okay, are they bringing back something that we conceptually stood up? The 
I guess the the orb that you have to collect for the hyper strike is interesting, but right. in watching you know a ton of media just on what that might be, given that the game is going online, it feels like that's going to be something that in order to get it, people might have to work together to uh, um, you know take advantage of what the hyper strike offers. Because I know a lot of people in in Mario Strikers Shards talked about the. Mega Strike being something that maybe you could manipulate too easily if you had a handful of power-ups, create some space and get it off. So that was different. I, I had no um, uh, preconceived notions about the equipment meta that they've added in. I think that's very interesting. It gives people a lot of choice. And it, it's also kind of... You know, it's neat seeing Mario in a whole bunch of different colors. The fact that you can choose uniform colors, that was a huge point of contention when we made the second Strikers game because there's color rules you have to manage with the intellectual property. Right. And so it's interesting that they kind of spread out now and said, let's let people customize and be who they want to be. And Peach doesn't have to be pink and Wario doesn't have to be yellow. So um, definitely some interesting takes and, and stuff I didn't expect to see. That's all really interesting to hear, uh, especially <laughs> with... It's funny to hear about some of the restrictions he had with the characters, given how far Mario Strikers as a series kind of pushed these characters beyond what we had ever seen before of them, where, like, Mario's just pissed off constantly, it looks like. <laughs> so, I guess, kind of to that point, um, can you tell us about how the series... Like, how it got started? Um, do you remember where the idea came from? Was it a Next Level Games idea? Was it Did it come from Nintendo? And how that kind of process evolved to to create, yeah, the Mario Strikers that we know today. So the, the first game we made at uh, Next Level was NHL Hits Pro, and that core experience was, you know, arcade hockey. We had right. taken it to five on five, and, and it was received well. Um, as a first game from a new studio, uh, it landed quite well. Uh, a business relationship linked up between us and Nintendo, and, and initially, you know, we didn't know kind of where it was gonna go, but they wanted a soccer game that was targeting the Western audience. So they wanted mm -hmm. something different. Um, funny enough, when we went through the initial prototype, we ended up making a uh, platforming style of soccer game. So we actually tried to make something that instinctually would fit the Eastern market, and that's not what they wanted. So they said, scrap that, start <laughs> again, and, and if we wanted to make something like that, we can make that ourselves. That's not why we approached you guys. And then we had to turn our attention and we said, well, let's let's take what's already been working in the company and let's leverage our core hits pro ID and turn that into this this soccer game. Um, and it was a very, ba the first game is very basic. It was built in just about 10 months. So it wasn't wow. very, very long, um, but it was really trying to embody they wanted personality, they wanted uh, the game to appeal to our audience, and, and the taste between the East and the West are very, very different. Um, but So that's kind of where, where, where it started from. Um, luckily, we got that second chance. We were worried that when we made the platforming version that, okay, that wasn't really the right initial take, and you're still creating that relationship. But we got our ducks in a row, embodied what we know, which is kind of putting a little bit of hockey and soccer, and you know, here we are, I guess, you know, uh, what is it? 17 years later, um, with uh, the third one coming out. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's wild as how long how long of a running the series this is now, and also the it, the relationship it helped establish with Next Level Games to the point where a Nintendo now owns the company, yeah. which <laughs> it's amazing how far that's come. Um, real quick, I have to ask more about that platforming soccer game. So, did that start? Was that a Mario uh, a Mario game two at that point? And what exactly did that look like? Yeah, it was. So it was basically, you know, again, Nintendo, I think the one thing that's really cool about working with them is they give you a lot of creative freedom and they they let you own things. Now, the flip side of that is you have to deliver on, on trying to connect to the expectations that they have for a product. So it was a Mario game uh, that we knew that they wanted a Mario soccer game. But again, our approach was maybe, you know, you're, you're, you're dealing with a big company for the first time. And this is that right. you're getting a chance to handle you know, an IP that not many developers get a chance to touch, quite frankly. And I think we just focused too narrow and, and tried to make, again, something that they wanted. They didn't give us too many clues. They just said Mario Soccer to see where we would go. Uh, we went in the wrong area and it was so, I don't know, it, it's really hard to describe because it was such a strange experience, but there were two goals that were kind of, if I remember correctly, nestled inside of castles. You could kind of, to dribble the ball, Mario or Luigi would get up on the ball and kind of 
like a circus animal will get on top of a ball and kind of roll it under their feet. Um, it didn't resemble soccer at all. It was Soccer was maybe the means to the end, mm -hmm. but it was just a weird concoction of trying to fit in what we thought they were looking for on top of a sport. And we had to flip that upside down uh, when we actually got the feedback and put soccer first and, and Lair Mario on second. Well, that's, that's super interesting to hear because I was reading that it was more of a serious take on soccer than Nintendo said, you know, like, no, make it more fun, so... No, yeah, it was, it was, our first take was, uh, it was, it was too much platform, way too much, way too much platform, too many castles, not enough soccer, and definitely not enough attitude, there was, there was zero attitude in that, that initial prototype that we made. So were you, would you like kick the ball at enemies? Is that how you like defeated them? Or were there even enemies at that point? Yeah, you had to. So in order to open, and again, I, I'm trying to pull on the archives in my brain right now. But if I remember correctly, you had to kick the ball at, I believe they were um, Goombas. And once you had taken out all the Goombas, the door of the castle would open. And then you could shoot the ball through the castle door. That's so great. again, if you think about it, trying to really jam more of everything not soccer into a soccer prototype and again it wasn't met with the best uh uh feedback so <laughs> luckily we got a chance to <laughs> yeah no that i think that ended up <laughs> working out in the end um so one of the things you mentioned on is it didn't have uh i think a, i think it's an attitude or something of that nature and that's something that you added to mario strikers and that is i think that's one of the most striking thing so to speak about mario strikers is just it, it presents these these Mario, this familiar cast of characters, like this very family-friendly cast of characters, not that they still aren't, just in a very different manner, where we've never seen Mario like this, like this intense before, or, you know, Daisy with this much sass, or Princess Peach even. How, how did that process evolve? Like, did that just come naturally as part of, like, incorporating elements of a kind of hockey game, which of course is famous for its fights, um, which might explain why, you know, maybe you're uh, bashing people in the electric fences in this game. Uh, just, can you tell us a little bit more about how, how that happened and, and how much leeway you had with these characters? Like, did, did Nintendo ever, was, did Nintendo ever step in like, no, you're going too far in this case, you can't, you can't do that, or? <laughs> well, I mean, I'll answer the last part first, I mean, they never really jumped in. I mean, the Waluigi crotch chop, I think, is one of the most, uh, uh, you know, one of the most famous things that he has going for him. It's, uh, I've seen it in so many concoctions. We, quite frankly, yep. didn't think that was going to get in. The overall vision, though, for what we were trying to do was, again, the the initiative was that let's try to make a Mario sports game that appeals to the West. And when we think about the West, you know, personality, uh, character, it's such a big part of our games, but then it's also a big part of sport. Uh, sports are about taking heroes and celebrating them and so we wanted to see if we could embody that and give the west something that you know there's nothing wrong with mario tennis mario baseball they're made by developers in other parts of the world so i think it's different takes and, and depending on where they are culturally but we said we understand how sports are is in the west and doesn't matter mm -hmm. if you're in the uk if you're in the u.s there's an attitude that comes with sports and so right. we wanted to embrace that and try to connect you know, to the emotion you feel on the couch when you score a big goal in a sports game. And, and you know, gamers are very competitive. So, you know, we weren't sure, were we gonna push it too far? You're gonna get feedback on that, but uh, working with Kensuke Tanabe, who is our, our creative director on their side, um, he liked where we were going and felt that this is what they were looking for, something different that's going to capture the imagination. And um, we just created personas for everybody. We tried to be, you know, true to who they were, but amp it up a bit more. So we don't think anybody is necessarily out of character. It's maybe seeing a deeper side of who they are within this world that we've created. And obviously when you got to Mario Strikers Charge, that went to a, a whole other level because <laughs> Strikers, you had a bit of it. Strikers Charge, they really blew out his characters. Yeah, I, I like I was revisiting both games recently. One of the things that stood out to me is uh, some of the interesting traits we had to accompany the characters in, in charged in particular, like how Waluigi has a banjo theme that plays, and uh, I think it was a Daisy has like a crystal theme. So yeah, how how like how do you explore those elements? Like how do you tie a character to to you know I don't know like a, an instrument or a a type of visual theme or aesthetic. Yeah, I mean, a lot of, again, a lot of it was looking into personality and trying to, it, it was hard. I mean, it was daunting what we took on, especially as a cast of characters grew in the sequel. We right. wanted to, again, go to a different level. And, you and know, next level? Sorry. Yeah, I knew it was going to happen. It's going to happen um, at some point, yeah. <laughs> um, 
you try to, a lot of it was about the personality of the character. And so, you know, was, does Waluigi match the banjo? Well, in the end, it, it felt like it did. Wario right. had sort of, you know, using a tuba, which is kind of representative. Our audio director at the time, Chad York, I mean, he was really a talented guy in terms of trying to figure out how to take the audio representation and match the personalities that are there. And, you know, it, it, it took time, it took work to figure that stuff out. But I think in the end, you know, through that iteration and having enough time from Nintendo to develop the sequel, we were able to figure those things out. Not everything worked initially, because you're trying to, again, create personalities that, again, we wanted to feel representative of who the characters are, but in this new world. So that's a that's an ask that takes sometimes a few iterations to get right, because we don't want to misrepresent the IP as well. We want to still have people go, yeah, that's Peach, but wow, I really love that representation of Peach or Bowser, whoever right. that you're uh, you're connected to. I mean, and to that point, I have to say, like, as one who you know, grew up with all these sports games, uh, like, I remember when Waluigi was first created for uh, the original Mario Tennis, I believe, and it just kind of felt like a lazy character creation, like both a duplicate of Luigi, like a combination of Luigi and Wario almost. But I think it was thanks to games like yours with Mario Strikers, like, they really helped infuse Waluigi with this really out there personality that made that he's like skyrocketed to the top of my favorite Mario characters list at this point. Um, but I also have to ask too, you kind of touched on it a little bit. One of the more surprising things is is getting that like that Wario or sorry, the Waluigi um, uh, crotch chop in there. Like was there any like you mentioned yourself, you thought that might be that wasn't gonna make it. So how did that how did that get through twice no less? I think it's in both games. Yeah, so it's far. in both games, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he actually in the sequel he kinda he has one of the cut sequences where he waves it off. Yeah, he's his like, finger, no, like, he's going to give it, it to you, and he's like, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> um, well, the inspiration for that came from, uh, quite frankly, like the shape, even though it's a V, we thought it was a representation of part of the W. So that's that's right. sort of his way of connecting into his, his, uh, his first initial. Um, you know, like Waluigi, we kind of depicted him as being... Yeah, he's a bit, I don't know, a bit edgier than Wario. Wario's kind of right. on the nose in terms of a bad guy. And Waluigi, we just wanted to, you know, explore him a bit more. And, you know, he's actually kind of mean to his sidekicks, too. They're both mean to their sidekicks. But Wario's about self-loathing, and <laughs> Waluigi is about blame. And, and everybody else has done something wrong. Um, and we just, we explored it. Now, we, again, the crotch shop... You just didn't expect it to get through, but you know nobody batted an eye, so we didn't kind of bring it up because we wanted it to be in there. And sure enough, it landed the way we expected it to. And I'm not sure if it's going to be in the threequel, but I'm really interested to see if it's still there. I hope it's still there. I was going frame by frame looking for it. I hope it's there too. It's just not the same without it. Um, I wonder if uh, if the if the cultural barrier might have helped with that. Like maybe they didn't register as being anything uh, in Japan or something. So. Yeah, probably. But something you know, if people don't ask questions, you just you just kind of don't bring it up, right? Yeah, <laughs> once once the discs are printed, you're you're off to the races, and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. Yeah, you can't pass it out back in those days. That's it. No. So, um, so uh, to expand a little bit, what was it like to work with Nintendo? How uh, how hands on were they with the project? Did they have any uh, specific feedback that I recall, you know, beyond, of course, changing it from a platforming game to a soccer game? And were they ever in the office itself, or was it all handled, um, you know, through the internet? Which, back in those days, I imagine, was probably still a kind of novel thing, if, if that were the case. Yeah, so, I mean, logistically, uh, we actually, I've been to Japan numerous times. We would usually go uh, three times a year, uh, so I think I've been there close to nine times over the, the time I was at Next Level, so, I mean... Uh, really amazing experience to, to see that country, but also to go to the uh, headquarters in Kyoto. And uh, so we would do meetings in person. I mean, mm. especially the remote world we're in right now, obviously that's something we're missing. Uh, any development studio, I think would say, especially when you're in the creative brainstorming session, doing it over Zoom or, or a Google Hangout is incredibly hard to do. Yep. Um, however, we did have a lot of calls as well. We would do calls at night after 5 p.m. and uh, get on video because that the conversations were important. As a company, I have to credit, you know, Nintendo and, and Tanabe-san for a lot of what I am today. They really empower you to do your job. Now that comes with responsibility. If you are not figuring out the game, um, and there were other examples as we worked through the project, we would have to work with them and try to understand how to be more on the nose, how to take direction better. But they don't micromanage, they don't hover over you. They tried to guide you and then let you find your way, which I think is a really important lesson in game development and something that I've uh, embodied ever since because it's how you get the best out of people. And again, it comes with responsibility, but once you understand that, I think people can be more effective. 
The other thing that Nintendo taught me that I've kept with me is uh, Tanabe-san would challenge us numerous times about thinking outside the box. He would say sometimes Western developers were very logical. We want to have one plus one equal two. Mm -hmm. And uh, he would say, well, if one plus one equals three and that's more fun, then that's what it should be. And so it's that's something as well that I've kept with me saying, if it's fun, let's put it in the game. Let's not worry if it makes sense. Uh, case in point, the first Strikers game, when Bowser was a distraction more than a character, uh, he would just come in and cause havoc and tilt the field. And we, we had a challenge, we were struggling with that. We said, well, why, why? And because there had to be a reason. And he's like, right. it doesn't have to be a reason as long as it's fun. Um, so yeah, very empowering, uh, teach you great lessons, uh, super easy to work with, and to be honest, like even though we didn't speak the same language and we had to communicate through translators, the dynamic was amazing. Like the, the ability to have patience with each other and work together, I was really worried about how is that going to, to function, and they just, they just know how to communicate with people. So it was a really, really, really big privilege for me to have that time with them. I've, I've heard Nintendo does give people time to figure things out in the past, like with retro studios and stuff, so uh, it's nice that you guys also had the same kind of experience. Uh, moving back though, you were talking about NHL Hits Pro being kind of an influence on the game. Uh, many of the staff though worked on Sega Soccer Slam. Did that come into a big part of Strikers as well with that experience? Yeah, we did. So I didn't work on that, that title, um, but we did look at that game as part of our research. I mean, we looked at all types of arcade soccer games that had come out. And, you know, Sega Soccer Slam, the people that had worked on it, there were shortcomings with it. I mean, it had great character, uh, really unique personalities. Uh, it, was a, it was a fun core game, but there were uh, shortfalls. And so when we looked at that, um, part of that research lead, it led to the Mario Kart power-up system uh, coming in. And also, to be honest, the Super Strike. So because Sega Soccer Slam had special shots as well, but there were things that didn't really meld into the core gameplay the way that you, you wanted. So that was part of our research and we, we pulled on people that had worked on it to get their feedback. And the good thing at Next Level is everybody's really honest. There's no egos. People just throw feedback on the table. And uh, that allowed us to pull the things from that experience and that development that worked, as well as avoid pitfalls that that, that team had to face too. Yeah, well, that's great to hear. And one of the major differences between Soccer Slam and uh, and Mario Striker is, is uh, you know, beyond the cast is the electrified fence. Which I remember seeing that for the first time. Like, oh my god! Like, are you? It feels like you're trying to murder these other Nintendo <laughs> characters. Um, do you remember how the where that idea came from and how and how that may have evolved um, over the course of the game? Is it just so so out there compared to what we normally see of uh, you know from Mario sports games? Well, the main motivation initially was to keep the flow of play going because we wanted three-minute matches as sort of the, the core experience. We don't want the ball to keep going out. I mean, throw-ins, right. if, yep. if you're playing you know, a, a pure simulation soccer game, corner kicks, goal kicks, throw-ins, they, they have a purpose. For what we were trying to build is let's keep the flow of play going. So initially it was just invisible walls that kept it in. And I, I believe it was Tanabe son that said, why don't we electrocute the, the outside and have that be a deterrent so you can have a decision to make because again if you hit somebody into the wall that doesn't have the ball you take them out of play you give the other team a power up but it becomes a tactical sort of rock paper scissors decision depending on what the game situation is there's a bit of hockey in there too of course like embodying a good you know a good body check into the boards uh, obviously you can't electrocute people in hockey but uh <laughs> Uh, there's a way to bring it to life and I know on the, the trailer for the sequel it's part of the opening sequence where the, fan, the fans are running into the electric wall because they're trying to get as close to the stadium as possible and yeah just a, a fun kooky idea that uh, really embodies the, the spirit of the game. Yeah no it's just a, it's a hilarious element and I, w one thing that kind of occurred to me as we're talking about this is, is when you released um, Mario Strikers Charged on the Wii it was fairly early, fairly early into its life cycle, and this was a platform where Nintendo was trying to, like, they're doing the whole Blue Ocean strategy. They're trying to reach people and have played games before. They're going for the more, like, accessible market, you know, they're making more accessible games. Uh, Wii Sports had a very friendly vibe to it. Then along comes Mario Strikers Charged, which somehow even amps the intensity from the first game, where you have, like, Mario and Bowser skydiving into the stadiums, and, uh, and it, it just, everything's, like, cranked up to 11. Um, it, how did the process for making that game work? Like, were you factoring in the audience that that the Wii was kind of targeting at all? Um, did that did that enter the conversation? Like, how did that process of like evolving on the Mario Strikers formula um, for a sequel go about? Well, I mean, we weren't you know if you're playing 
Wii Sports exclusively, then Striker's Charge wasn't for you. There's no question about that. It, it's it, it became more of a battle sport than even a, a soccer game in the second second product. A lot of what you see in the sequel were ideas that we had for the initial game, but again, that 10-month cycle, you can only get so much done in that period of time. And then because the game landed so well on sell through on GameCube, the sequel got, got lit very, very quickly after. We did, however, though, like Nintendo was, they're very smart, like even though the Wii had a lot of different functionality with, you know, being able to use motion controls, use the camera pointing it at the screen, the, the initiative was never to try to make that stuff fit just because it's something that they have or something they can market. They said, let's use things that make sense towards the game. So, um, you know, we use the motion just for flicking and hitting. We did have the, the Mega Strike, which we thought was an interesting way to, to evolve the Super Strike and use that functionality in a way that made sense for the game. So those things were taken into consideration, but it was more for the audience that you know played the initial one, as well as potentially another group of players looking for, not everybody's looking for absolute simplicity, even on a Nintendo right. platform. They want something a little with a little bit more meat on the bones. So, uh, and, and the second game did, did very well and found a market. And again, I think they're positioned very well with the install base of the Switch to do incredibly well with, uh, with, with this threequel. With the motion controls, were there any ideas that you tried out that didn't make it into the game that just didn't work? No, to be honest, like we, when we, we just prototyped the hitting right away and we felt that this, it captures the, you know, the input or the desire of like wanting to take somebody out. So the physicality of it really connected well. It wasn't too much to ask from the player. I know when everybody got the, the Wii, myself included, like I had bad elbow tendonitis from playing endless Wii bowling and trying to figure out like, maybe I don't need to put that much motion into the actual controller. So that was part of the lesson too, because it was, you're using, muscles you don't normally use because that's not typically how you game. Once we got that in, rather than complicating and trying to figure out more, we said, that's good enough. Like, let's just leave that uh, because of how the other controls work with the buttons. And then the Mega Strike um, is the idea of let's evolve it and then we can take advantage of, you know, being in the goalie's perspective and, and using that functionality in a meaningful way uh, to try to, you know, come back in games. It, it, that, that feature evolved to kind of, to make the player say, hey, you're never truly out of it. You know, you could, potentially get six goals, which is a huge gap to make up in any sports game. Right. And after we had those two, that was it. That was enough. And, and there was no push to like put more in, put more in. We were we were happy with it. They were happy with it. And we moved forward to other parts of the game. Well, speaking of putting more into it, um, I think that is actually one of the things that Strikers or uh, that Charge does is there's a lot of new content in the game. You expanded the roster. There's a lot of new moves beyond even the um, uh, the Mega Strike, I believe. I sorry, I get all three of them confused now. They all have different <laughs> names. <laughs> and uh, like every character has a special move now, um, where like Waluigi literally makes a wall, a wall which yeah. I appreciate. <laughs> um, do you remember more about how how uh, how the process worked for exploring what mechanics you could add, add to the game, how you could expand the gameplay beyond what you had time for in the first one yeah so we you know the first game was great but it was very simple in terms of what it offered and you know while it's still something i know a lot of people pick up and play you know in college dorms and things like that it didn't really have the depth uh over time so we wanted to create that depth and we really focused on the gameplay meta being an area that we wanted to expand and making each character feel uh special so you know sidekicks had their skill shots which obviously you know they create scoring opportunities, or in some cases, like Birdo's egg uh, goes right into the net. The whole concept, though, around charging is really where that that feature came from. Was about can we take the idea of you know finding open space and charging towards a super strike or a mega strike, and have that be something that also can be embodied by the sidekicks? And then with each sidekick having different charge times, different outcomes. Obviously, that creates different choice in how to build your team, uh, and then also how to tactically play because. Uh, for example, Toad's skill shot just sets the goalie's hand on fire so a critter can't catch the ball, but it takes an incredibly short amount of time to do. So depending on who you are and how you want to play, you can you know, go to town with uh, the team makeup that you're looking for. And then for the captains, the separation was we really wanted to turn them into superheroes. So their, um, their special power-ups needed to be a level above the skill shot. So again, like literally Mario and Luigi growing to the size of skyscrapers and being able to to crush players and and even when they get tackled it's funny because a small character taking out a giant's leg was really interesting um wario obviously passing gas and, and reversing controls on people um i'll say you know over time it was really challenging because we had you know 20 characters in the game to come up with ideas that were not only uh, 
unique but different and compelling from a gameplay perspective. Right. Uh, like the Waluigi Wall, that one was tough. That was probably our toughest uh, superhero ability that we had in the game. And if you can imagine, as you're building this, the matrix grows and grows and grows. And now you have to figure out how do all these things interact? Should yeah. Should Birdo's egg go through the wall? Should the wall destroy Birdo's egg? Does Toad's shot light the wall on fire? Um, for example, when Wario farts, if Toad shoots his ball through, that blows up the fart. Um, <laughs> these were all, the, the, the gameplay matrix was insane, uh, what we had right. to come up with. And luckily, it just all worked really well because we had time to iterate. Yeah, that definitely that definitely showed. Although looking at the release dates for the game, and obviously I don't know if the game if the first game released right after it's finished development. I assume that it probably was around there, but I believe it looked like you only had maybe a year and a half or so to work on Charged. Is that correct? Yeah, We're that's still... yeah, eighteen months about. Yeah, got it. So that's uh, almost double what the first game was, I guess. So that gave you the time you needed to add all that. So is it um? So actually, two questions. <laughs> Uh, for for Waluigi's wall, was that literally just because he had wall in his name? And you're like, let's try making a wall ability. <laughs> With uh... it, there, there was some of that. He was one of the last ones that we did. And so it was also trying to figure out what can we do that's different? Because a lot of times what we were running into over the course of development is, well, that's a great idea, but it's too much like this sidekick ability or this superhero ability. So that's not going to work. We didn't want to have... You don't want to have repetition. You want to have something that makes the choice unique in the gameplay meta. So the wall part was part of it. Um, to be honest, when we started, I remember the programmers were just like, I don't know. I don't know if this is if this is going to work because it was complicated to draw. Um, it was complicated from a control perspective to make it work. But we, you know, Next Level had a really good gameplay team. We were really solid in that area and um, we were going to make it work. It, it, it did make sense. He says wall when he lets it go. So there was a lot of components that really embodied, again, who he was. Right. Um, and, and in the end, it worked. It was, you know, there's a lot of, there's Tron inspiration there as well, right? Which, which somebody, mm -hmm. I think, that's where it actually started from. Somebody said, what if there was a Tron wall? Uh, which could deflect or box things in. And if you're really good with it, right, you can box him in and do a mega strike from within the encasement right. of the wall, which is really the, the way we wanted you to use it. I remember that, yeah. That was always a fun fun thing to pull off, although it sucked when you were on the opposite end of that wall. Yeah, I need to. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Tom. Uh, well, luckily, we were able to do that too, Tom, because the game was online, although I want to ask about that in a moment. Um, I did want to return back to all the special abilities you had added. Because again, we haven't fully seen the new the new Mario Strikers Battle League. Of course, there could be more stuff in there they're they're hiding, uh, but it does look like on the surface it may be a little simplified compared to the second game. It looks like almost like it may be taking a step back to uh, the core mechanics of the original, with a few changes, of course, like the gear and the uh, the orb you have to collect now. I was wondering if you had any thoughts on that. Like, do you think that's um, is that a good direct or you know what, what's your sense of that direction potentially for the game? Uh, just based on what we've seen so far. I, I would say, like, you, you know, you mentioned it earlier, I don't think we've seen everything yet. Right. So I, I think there's still surprises in there. I'd be surprised if the sidekicks still don't have some type of skill shot or ability to mm -hmm. impact the game. Um, going online and having a full 4v4 experience, I think, is, is really where a lot of what I see um, changing where the impact is coming from. Because now you have to consider, as opposed to just me versus you, uh, in, in the experience, we have eight players. And so how does that impact what's there? The orb really, it, it makes you think about you know, do you have to work together as a team to try to unleash unleash a hyper strike? Right. Is kind of where my head has gone now after seeing it. Um, but it's also like, it's, it's definitely closer to the first strikers. That's, I think that makes a lot of sense at the end of the day because the Switch itself doesn't have the same uh, control or, or technical capability as, as the Wii did in terms of what's available to the player. And it just, it makes sense to build on that platform. But I think we haven't, you know, to your point, you know, you've, you've looked at this stuff as long as I have. We haven't seen everything yet. And they're right. masters of holding things back. And I think almost in a lot of cases, it's, you know, trying to mislead you to thinking Maybe it's too simple, and then there's going to be other surprises that they unleash as we head towards June. But uh, a lot of it lands where I thought the game would go, just knowing the differences between what the Wii was and what the Switch is today. Uh, speaking of differences, uh, and there's no uh, critter as goalie in the new one. Uh, in the original, though, who thought of bringing a Kremlin on board into a Mario game? Do you remember any of that? 
we just, it was again, we had a chance to look at the cast of characters to try to decide, uh, you know, who we want. And then we have to request that. So they would have to approve if that character could fit. And for us, the, the critter, what we liked about him, when you think about goalies throwing save animations, he had really good extremities. And so that, the idea of his arms being long and his body being long, when you think of a soccer goalie and the types of poses that they're in when they're making saves, he was really the best uh, character within their library because a lot of the characters you know they're short stubby arms aren't very long I mean, Mario's arms are not uh, are not super long uh, and obviously a character like Waluigi we wanted to reserve to be someone you could play as in the game and so the critter just stood out and that was the main inspiration was that he, he fit the mold of what would allow us to make his saves look great um, and you know in the end it was you know I think he it's a good job for the critter he's been you know relieved of his duties now and has moved on to something else I'm sure in Donkey Kong <laughs> country somewhere down the road but uh, I he hope did so. his job. yeah it's interesting too because I believe I again my brain is like mush these past few days but I believe it's a charge and chuck now that is is it charge and chuck that's I th the goal I, th I believe so yeah Okay, yeah, which is interesting because it, that seems to be counter what you were going for with Krem with uh, Critter, where you know uh, Charging Chuck is a little bit more, a little bit more, you know, a little bit more compact, shorter limbs. Um, so it's just it is interesting to see the kind of direction that they're taking it, and I wonder, you know, if that it just if that's going to have much of an impact on the visual style of it all. So well, I mean, he's got a fairly big midsection, so I mean, just sort of spinning on this, I'm sure there's probably some interesting dynamic positions he could get in um he doesn't have t-rex arms they are a bit shorter <laughs> but um you know i, I think you, you as long as it works for gameplay change is good and right. uh, i think there's a lot you know stubbier characters you could choose that wouldn't be as effective so so far from what i've seen it looks like he has good character for a goalie and i'm, I'm curious maybe there's even more goalies that, that's something i've been thinking about too it might not just be one goalie um that'd be cool because uh, i think where they're going with characters you know, it seems to be an opportunity there potentially for meta around the goalie as well. Well, and kind of speaking of characters, actually, one of the kind of changes in this game is it seems that you can basically have any any combination of characters you want. You can have you know, Mario, Peach, Bowser, all on the same team. Whereas in the original games, you were basically restricted to one of the big characters like Mario or Luigi, and then you had the team of sidekicks to back that up. Um, was there any uh, any? Do you remember the the process for for why that came to be and? Uh, and um, yeah, just why you stuck with it for the second game as well. Just just because it felt like those the characters that are in the main spotlight felt that they were more appropriate to be captains. Um, and again, like back then, it was even in the online was one v one. So you know who, who's your leader of your team, and then who's coming with you. And obviously, the second game was much more dynamic. And like myself, I always played with Wario, two Monty Moles, and a Dry Bones on. Uh, the back end that was my my go-to team they didn't run very well but they could shoot and they could hit and that's what i uh that's what i liked and uh, we just wanted like the characters that were sidekicks they just felt better as supporting characters it would be hard to imagine for us back then anyway maybe it's changed now but dry bones as a captain she's not very dynamic doesn't talk right. um his sounds are you know xylophone uh inspired <laughs> sounds and so they just felt good they still had personality but they felt better uh, sort of behind the characters that we chose to be captains. Now you touched on the um, the online there, and if I, if I remember correctly, I think Strikers Charged was one of the first online Wii games, if not if not the first, definitely among them. Um, do you remember much about how that you know about that process of making an online game on Nintendo's? I imagine more limited infrastructure back then, and uh, if there were any challenges involved in that. Yeah, it was, it was, you know, credit to our tech team back then because it was definitely a, a massive undertaking. And if I remember correctly, we were the first uh, Wi-Fi game uh, that they had. So it was also wow. a challenge being being the first ones uh, to come out. The, the challenge, like one thing Nintendo's really good at is they take their previous technology and they, they reuse it in future cycles, which is really smart because they're never yeah. throwing things away. And they're masters of like, you know, how many 3DSs were there as an example, right? And they change one thing and, and, and bring that coming forward. The infrastructure though came from what the DS had to offer. So that was part of the challenge was coming across, examples would be like, um, you know, on a single uh, Wii, uh, how do you have multiple profiles? Because the DS was a singular system. So you had one, I had one, we play on our own, that's the way it goes. You don't typically have access to uh, a profile on mine. And when we thought about, well, how is a, a family of kids going to play and have different profiles or me's to play in, in the online if they choose to do it, those challenges were tough because to your point, it wasn't something 
that they were experts at at the time. It wasn't a focus. It was more of a Western uh, way of playing. Uh, right. You know, again, credit to our team because we pioneered it, and I think the guys really you know, put in place the foundation for other titles to to build off some of the tech that we built. Uh, luckily, we're you know further into the future now, and I think Nintendo's evolved quite a bit, and I, I'm really excited to see where the online experience has gone, and, and it should they should just blow it up uh, so much more, and people are, I think are really going to get a chance to enjoy the game the way that it was probably uh, meant to be enjoyed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I imagine 15 years of uh, tech infrastructure changes would probably help with that and actually there's a quick question for you do you do you have any insight or any thoughts as to why it's taken 15 years for us to get a mario strikers sequel since charge because we've had other mario sports games in the time since we've had new tennises we've had new golf and for whatever reason it seems like strikers are kind of left on the sidelines do you think it was simply because next level games might have been tied up with other projects and nintendo didn't want to try another developer or i mean yeah do you have any ideas i, I think i mean you know again even you know, we haven't talked about Punch-Out, but as an example, I think Nintendo, they make sure the timing is right. I, I don't, they're not ones to just throw something out and destroy an IP. And I think right. they realize they have something really special with the Striker series. And, you know, you can release a game whenever. There's tons of year-on-year -year releases in, in the industry. And I think even if you look back historically at the gaps between the tennises and the golf, you know, there's a surprising number of years and you could argue, well, they could come out sooner. Even, you know, a lot of people thought we'd see a, another Mario Kart in the the, more re the most recent Nintendo Direct and, you know, it's tracks, but they, they really make sure that they're not going to create fatigue by releasing something too soon. I think as well, when you look at a product like Strikers, you'd say, okay, you can change the gameplay and make a new experience. But what's going to separate it? And when you look at what they have with the Battle League and, and the whole package, again, waiting for the right time to deliver something that's going to meet expectations and feel like this is something I have to have, I think that's important. Uh, otherwise, you know, series can get tired, they can get fatigued, and uh, you can end up ruining something. And I know they, they really value their IPs, so um, I, I think it's the right time. I know people wanted it sooner, but if you think back, the Wii U wouldn't have been the place for it, and, yeah. and this this feels like the right the right timing, despite people having to be patient. <laughs> or maybe Mario Strikers could have saved the Wii U. <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure. I'm not sure about that. <laughs> I, don't know, I just read that as hope for F Zero, no, but. I <laughs> Now, if I remember correctly, the cast did did involve characters from both the original Punch Out and Super Punch Out. I think. Um, so, how did you how did you decide on who to bring back? And I believe you even added a new character too with a Disco Kid. So, how did that process go between like figuring out who all is actually going to appear in the game, and and then uh, I'll have a follow up to that. <laughs> well, I mean, the, you know, the the original cast from the first game all came across like they they all fit, and then. When we had the design, the design initially was we wanted to build the game for two audiences. We wanted to build it for, uh, say, dads that had grown up with the NES version of the game, as well as, say, their kids that are playing games for the first time on the Wii. So the recreation of the series, when we were building it, we also said, let's try to bring in some of the characters that uh, sort of create representation across the world. So like Bear Hugger being Canadian, well, we had to, we had to pull him in and have him there. <laughs> Aaron Ryan, we thought, had a very interesting personality that we could really bring to life. And if you see, like, there's some similarities between what we did in Strikers to Punch Out, where we're bringing these characters to life in, in a way that the developers previously were unable to because it was just text on the screen. So we just cherry picked the ones that we felt added, you know, different uh, personalities to the entire cast uh, to go with the original crop from the, the NES, which we thought was strong. And that's where we, where, where we ended up at the end of the day. Um, they had to be able to represent personas, like the clown in SNES, like it just ones that just didn't make a lot of sense to us to, uh, to bring forward. So we left those ones behind. And kind of to that point, what was the process like for uh, evolving these characters or e elaborating upon them, um, particularly for the fact that there were some elements of the original that didn't age particularly well. So how did you, um, how did the process go for like, you know, choosing uh, you know, how to represent these characters and their and their nationalities? And um, yeah, was that like a was that a delicate balance at all? And figuring out like, hey, what's what might be a little bit too much here, or like, you know, this is you know, it's clear that we're just poking, you know, we're just having fun with it here at this point. Well, so the one one advantage we had, we had voice actors that. Um, we drew on that that 
were embodied the nationality of the characters. So um, we used them as a touch point to make sure that we weren't doing anything that was going to come across as being offensive. Comedy is hard, right. and I would say <laughs> even now today in 2022, if we were making Punch Out today, I think it would be even more challenging, quite frankly, mm -hmm. um, uh, given kind of where everything is at. But we wanted to make sure that the game could still. Uh, you know, be funny and poke fun without crossing a line. So there were a lot of conversations on that. There's similarities in terms of how, how do we create the personalities, very similar to Striker's Charge. We had a formula for how to define personas and, and bring them to life. Um, and yeah, yeah, it was delicate at times. You know, we had to change certain things like Piston, uh, Piston Honda had to be Hondo, and that's just yeah. due to Japanese business culture. Right. And, and I guess, you know, back on the NES, things were different, but that had to change. Um, Disco Kid, yeah, they just empowered us to make our own character. And mm -hmm. uh, Disco Kid, we kind of gave our, our character team uh, creative uh, freedom to come up with him. We wanted him to be an early character, somebody that you could, everybody would get a chance to see. Um, and, you know, even he would be met with you know, varying degrees of Ready for this? Yeah! Disco Kid! But overall, it was great. Oh no! Here it comes. Um, alive and in the game and, and again taking characters and uh, putting them in a, a light that people hadn't seen before. Uh, speaking of voice acting though, uh, you were the voice actor for Super Macho <laughs> Man. How did you end up as that role? Well, I, I, I've, I've, I guess uh, with my background going to school for broadcasting and doing some voice work previously, I always try to I, you cut costs if you use me. You don't have to pay me. I just get a chance to go in. Um, so I, I auditioned and uh, uh, managed to, to hit the role. Obviously, my voice was pitch shifted uh, a bit to, to connect, but... Uh, Are you ready? Because I'm going to put on a show. That was, yeah, it's been a, a huge privilege to be part of the game building it, but also to voice a character I grew up beating up on my uh, parents' <laughs> uh, living room floor. So... Uh, it was a lot of fun to do, and, and it's great to, to know that the voice, is, uh, the voice is in there. I had a blast doing it. Do you ever replay uh, the game yourself, and is it weird hearing yourself coming from the game? <laughs> I, I mean, I don't go back and play that. I, I still get the odd video that pops up on YouTube where people are compiling the clips from the game or uh, cutting together weird rave <laughs> dance scenes from the fight. Um, I'm okay hearing my own voice. It's kind of, it's fun. It, it's just more... All the stuff, especially the Nintendo time, I never envisioned that I would have that experience in my life. So every experience I had with Nintendo is a bit, uh, uh, it's a bit crazy, to be quite honest, at the end of the day, because right. I've loved games my whole life. I never envisioned I would be making them, let alone working on games that were such a big part of my childhood and, and then alone get a chance to voice one of the characters in one of those games. Yeah, no, that's super cool. I can, I, I can hear, I can hear the voice in my head right now. I'm like, well, that was spot on. That was, that was great. Um, you know, there is actually what we were talking about. Disco Kid, who's a new character to the game, but there technically is another character added to the game. Spoilers, but the final character yeah. was Donkey Kong. Um, how did that come about, if you remember? And did that require like special approval from Nintendo again? How did that whole process work? So that's uh, Tanabe's son, again, just being full of surprises, just thinking outside the box and adding something that normally wouldn't wouldn't be there is, is where that came from. And uh, uh, in Nintendo games, I think, historically, have always had lots of surprises in them, and right. I think that's something that they're... Uh, they're known for kind of like sitting around the end of a movie to see if there's a sneak peek at what's coming next. Um, so yeah, DK, you know, he's never been there, but he made sense to be in there. And uh, even in the downloadable um, uh, uh, aspect stuff that came up with Doc Lewis after was also a nice uh, treat that was included in the series. So uh, yeah, those are just fun game things. Like I think more games honestly should pull on surprises like that and, and stuff that brings a smile to your face. Totally. Uh, were there any other characters that were considered at any point for Punch Out Wii that you recall that, or any other features as well, like anything that didn't quite make the cut uh, for the final release? No, we got everything, and uh, we did have some. Uh, there were prototypes with mini games. We had a bunch of sort of skill games that we wanted to try to get in. Uh, they were fun, but they didn't really feel like they were going to fit. It felt like it was taking away. And again, when you're going to spread yourself a bit too thin, 
and start focusing on something that takes away from the core experience. Right. It's better to kind of cut that stuff away and, and focus on what really brings uh, the game to life. But now the vision of the, the main fights and the title defense and then PvP, which was an interesting uh, venture as well. Those all got in and, and the vision came to life. And uh, yeah, Nintendo's really good as well. Not, you know, if it's just gonna be extra fat, you know, on, on, on a quality piece of meat, don't do it. Like, make sure it's just quality at the end of the day. And um, we typically didn't miss anything. We, we really wanted to get into the game with, with all three of those titles. Great. So yeah, so I guess for Strikers 2, there wasn't really any major content that, that didn't make it into either release. No, I mean, you know, Strikers 1, it was about hitting uh, a deadline because the GameCube was on its sort of, you know, last hurrah and they wanted right. to see if it would uh, do well with the install base that was there. So there's a lot of things we didn't get in to Strikers 1, but that was okay. It was about setting the table. Strikers Charge, no, like everything we wanted to get in uh, we got in again like the tornado i spoke about earlier there's small things like that but again if they're not working it's not something that's going to be missed it it has to be something that you really wanted to get in and typically we everything we did with nintendo if we wanted it in the game it got in the game oh that's awesome and one of the things i was just reminded of, of the is the fact that yeah, as you touched on earlier you know bowser was a obstacle in the original game but he was promoted to a character in charged um was that something that you had always wanted to do or it just kind of evolved from you know, having adding characters to the game. It's like, yeah, why not bring Bowser in, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the first one, again, we had to make a choice. He was a bigger he was a bigger character and um, in terms of size and structure. So we couldn't get, again, it was about time in the first Strikers game. We had to make concessions, but right. we definitely wanted him on the field. And it's just that, especially in sports, with the rivalry that he has with Mario, the opening trailer for Strikers Charge with the two of them, you know, on the, the ship and, and diving into the stadium, that that's what the mushroom kingdom is those two guys are like if they're going to play sports they're going to be rivals and so right. he he definitely was making it the sequel without question um and speaking of that intro uh it was a fully in both games it's like a fully pre-rendered thing was that all handled like was that handled in house or was that outsourced to anyone and um, what's the process of that like do you have to lock that in you know pretty early into the process or Nintendo, they work with a, a different company, so we didn't have, uh, we had creative input on okay. the actual uh, sequence to make sure that it embodied the game, but it was done by a, a separate company. I believe they were in Singapore. Um, and, and I don't know if they do all the trailers, but they definitely right. did the first two, the first, uh, the trailers for the first two Strikers games. Um, and, you know, they took feedback and it was great to be part of that process and make sure that what we were selling in the trailer was actually something that could happen in the game was really all we were looking for. Very cool, and um, it as actually kind of related to that, but one of the features that of Mario Strikers Charge that always impressed me was the crowd in the game. Um, I don't know if you remember much about the development of how that worked, but I remember being a massive upgrade from the GameCube one, where they felt the crowd actually felt like it was 3D, where they were smoothly animated, they changed their perspective changed depending on the camera. Was that a challenge at all? Do you remember like making a crowd that looked that good? Or <laughs> on the, on the GameCube, it was a challenge. So we ended up with more of the the two D cutouts. Right. But then on on the Wii, obviously we had a little bit more horsepower to uh, to play with, and so we wanted to bring them to life and 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 just make it feel like the game had evolved. And so it was it was definitely something that the rendering team had to look at because it's in some of the stadiums there's a lot of <laughs> a lot of crowd that's there, and you don't want the crowd to impede gameplay. But it was nice that we were able to get it to evolve and and make it feel alive and have it be part of the experience. And again, in that trailer when they're running towards the electrical wall, you know, it's representative. And when you get into the game, you see that those characters are alive. And this idea that the Mushroom Kingdom is just in utter chaos over this sport, it's just cool to see that actually come come to life, which is, that's our interpretation of how they perceive sport. <laughs> now, speaking of characters that are alive, there is debatably a team in the game, in the original game, that isn't alive, being the unlockable team, the, uh, I think the super robot team, or... Super team, Super yeah. team, thank you. Uh, where'd they come from? <laughs> because I don't... So that, that's, that's another, uh, it's, uh, it's an obvious it gets credit for that as well, so just... I think there's always a thing where you think you're done the game, but you're not. Right. So when you actually win, you know, a, a cup in, in the first Strikers, which is very simple gameplay uh, modes, you think you're done and then the super team arrives. And the super team is just a, and it's an insanely tough uh, team to beat. And uh, so Tanabe came up with that. You know, they did make a cameo in Strikers Charged on the credits, uh, sweeping up the stage at the All end. Right. And, uh, then we kind of reveal that Bowser has a hand in the super team because he kind of 
growls off camera and, and the super team guy, a uh, robot, sort of hangs his head and walks off the stage after getting yelled at. So they're still in there. Who knows, maybe they'll make an appearance again. Um, but yeah, that was just Tanabe again, thinking outside the box and uh, showing us that really anything should be possible when you make a game. I totally forgot about the, that they would return for charge. Now I need more lore of this team now. I need. I, I hope know. they come back in the third one. <laughs> Um, well, speaking of working on Nintendo properties, were there any others you would have you would have liked to have worked on, or even still? Like, are there any games that you think you know would be fun to uh, work in the Nintendo catalog, um, or is that all kind of behind you at this point? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's an interesting question. Um, you know, obviously, I think it's not not really anything I've really thought about to be honest with you. But <laughs> um, doing more Western takes on other Mario sports games, I think, would be interesting. Um, I, I love baseball video games uh, immensely, and um, no, I, there's nothing wrong with the Mario baseball offerings that have been out there, but it, it would be interesting to, to see or have an opportunity to make you know, other sports within the same vein of what Strikers is. But what I'll also say is what makes the mystique around Strikers what it is is because that's the only place you can get it. So there's also this right. idea of if you kind of sprinkle that everywhere, does the original inspiration become less interesting? And so sometimes keeping that in a special place um, is better than trying to come up with more more versions. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I would love you know in the future working with Nintendo again would be great. Um, you kind of never know where this this crazy industry is going. But I'm you know super again super thankful for you know the the nine years I spent working with them and. Uh, uh, yeah, it was just a, a huge, huge honor and privilege to, to be able to, to take part in, in their history. Do you have uh, any favorite memories from working at Next Level Games? Oh, lots. I mean, it was, you know, it was a great, um, you know, a, a really great time. You know, our, our trips to Japan were awesome. Like getting a, getting a chance to see, um, we got a chance to see the Wii. Uh, when it was in a prototype phase as we were working on Strikers because they were trying to sort of get us to think about what was there. It, it, the memory is very interesting because going to the Nintendo headquarters, it's not what you'd expect. It's kind of like visiting a basic room in Metal Gear Solid. There's no decorations, <laughs> it, it, there's no posters, it doesn't have the same cultural stuff that we do here in the West to try to create that energy and creativity. It's very, yeah, very, very uh, uh, sort of basic, white. Mm -hmm. um, and we went into this huge room and the room was just massive. And I remember the carpet was pink and at the far end was like a 13 inch TV with some contraptions in front of it. And so we're in there testing out the Wii remotes for the first time in the smallest TV in this huge room and it was just such a weird contrast but it was very memorable because we're like well this is pretty cool but you're also trying to understand why is the tv so small why are we in such a big room <laughs> um you know all the trips to japan were were a ton of fun we had a lot of fun just exploring and and getting a chance to learn about a new culture and also a culture that just embraces gaming uh, so much so that was uh, a ton of fun and you know a lot of good friends a lot of, a lot of people that i work with at next level that i'm still friends with today uh, definitely cheer for them on the side. I mean, any, everybody that makes a great game is good for the industry and it doesn't matter if you're working with them or it's sometimes even in competition with them in certain cases. The more the more great games people make, the better it is for everybody. So, uh, yeah, it was a really awesome uh, time there and, and something I'll cherish for the rest of my life. Oh, that's, that's great to hear. And a super, super important question. Is that a Strikers Charged Arcade cabinet yeah. behind you? It is. It is. Um, that was a, what? A guilty, a guilty pleasure purchase during the the pandemic. Um, so I, yeah, I, you know, like again, it's you know, it's great we're talking about this today. It's definitely one of the games that um, you know I'm proud of everything I've worked on, but it definitely has a special place uh, in my heart. And um, you know, again, I'm excited for what's there. And and that's for me, it was a chance to kind of commemorate uh, a memory and, and a game that I'm I'm really proud of. And uh, uh, yeah, so I've always, as a kid, I always wanted a, an arcade cabinet and said, you know what, I'm not really traveling or spending money on other things in the pandemic, let's pull the trigger and, and pay homage to, to one, of the, one of the best games I worked on. Oh, that's awesome. I didn't even see that. I'm glad you saw that, Tom. So is that, <laughs> so that's not, that's not an official thing though, right? Was, was there an no, official No, no, that's arcade? my own, yeah, that's my own custom, custom wow. cabinet. Wow. I just got the, the wrap and the, the marquee and, and the design of the, the entire thing, even the control panel, everything is dedicated to, uh, 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 to the game. So even the control panel, you've got Wario uh, and Mario and the, the colored joysticks and buttons are all mapped out in there. Uh, 
their uniform colors and then the track ball in the middle is white to represent the highest charge on the ball so a lot of thought went into it to try to make sure it represents uh what's captured in the series oh my god that's amazing if you don't mind i might have to ask you for some pictures of that that looks that yeah, no worries, seems incredible yeah, <laughs> yeah. uh is that you said that's for charged that's a that, yeah that's a charge charged dedicated on cabinet yeah that's so cool. I'm so it's so incredibly jealous right now. And <laughs> it's they should make it an official thing. That's like the perfect type of arcade style gameplay that, you know, I would love to see in well, whatever arcades are left, but <laughs> that's so cool. Mike, do you have any final thoughts and uh, where people might be able to follow you and your work in the future? That'd be great to hear. Yeah, so I mean for me right now I'm over at uh, EA Sports working on you know, another game that I grew up with on the NHL series, so it was a, another chance to you know, tick another box in this crazy path of working on things that I grew up playing. Uh, so, you know, have an eye out for future releases of NHL and uh, looking forward to evolving that series and, and taking it to new heights. Um, that's where I am right now. I mean, if you want to connect with me on Twitter, um, my handle on there is at the Big Win Mike. Um, so happy to chat with people on there and they can connect with me and talk with a lot of Strikers fans on there uh, periodically. And uh, yeah. Follow along, see what happens, and uh, looking forward to this game coming out and wish everybody that's worked on it, even though uh, the best of luck with that release. Maybe uh, maybe we can play an online match uh, when it releases. Sounds good to me, yeah. Right, that'd be awesome. <laughs> Mike, thank you so much for joining us uh, for this amazing interview. It's been a ton of fun uh, finding out about your development, uh, your time with the game and the series in general and Punch-Out and all that. It's been a complete blast. And if anyone wants to follow you, I will have a link to your, to your Twitter in the description below, so just give it a click, follow Mike there. And uh, once again, thank you for joining us. It's just been a complete blast talking with you about, uh, about these fantastic games. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Appreciate being here.